Victorian Periodical Parade. Hello and welcome to October. It's official. We have begun the thriller series. Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon is here. Now we are on installment two. where Mr. Talby's presumably arrives in England. Is he going to meet his beloved wife and child? Well, we're about to find out. So come with me and we'll take the adventure together. Chapter 4 In the First Page of the Times Robert Audley was supposed to be a barista. As a barista, his name was inscribed in the law list. As a barista, he had chambers in Fig Tree Court Temple. As a barista, he had eaten the allotted number of dinners, which form the sublime ordeal through which the forensic aspirant wades on to fame and fortune. If these things can make a man a barista, Robert Audley decidedly was one. But he had never either had a brief or tried to get a brief, or even wished to have a brief, in all those five years during which his name had been painted upon one of the doors in Fig Tree Court. He was a handsome, lazy, care-for-nothing fellow of about seven-twenty, the only son of a young brother of Sir Michael Audley. His father had left him four hundred pound a year, which his friends had advised him to increase by being called to the bar and as he found it, after due consideration, more trouble to oppose the wishes of these friends than to eat so many dinners and to take a set of chambers in the temple, he adopted the latter course and unblushingly called himself a barista. Sometimes, when the weather was very hot and he had exhausted himself with the exertion of smoking his German pipe and reading French novels, he would stroll into the temple gardens and lying in some shady spot, pale and cool, with his shirt collar turned down and a blue silk handkerchief tied loosely around his neck, would tell grave benchers that he had knocked himself up with overwork. The sly old benchers laughed at the pleasing fiction, but they all agreed that Robert Audley was a good fellow, a generous-hearted fellow, rather a curious fellow, too, with a fond of sly wit and quiet humour, under his listlessness dawdling in different, irresolute manner. A man who would never get on in the world, but would not hurt a worm. Indeed, his chambers were converted into a perfect dog-kennel by his habit of bringing some stray and benighted curs who were attracted by his looks in the street, and followed him with abject fondness. Robert always spent the hunting season in Audley Court. Not that he was distinguished as a nimrod, for he would quietly trot to convert upon a mild-tempered, stout-limbed bay hack, and keep at a very respectful distance from the hard riders, his horse knowing quite as well as he did that nothing was further from his thoughts than, say, than any desire to be at the death. The young man was a great favorite with his uncle, and by no means despised by his pretty, gypsy-faced, light-hearted, hoydenish cousin, Miss Alicia Audley. It might have seemed to other men that the partiality of a young lady, who was sole heiress to a very fine estate, was rather well worth cultivating, but it did not so occur to Robert Audley. Alicia was a very nice girl, he said, a jolly girl with no nonsense about her, a girl of a thousand. But this was the highest point to which enthusiasm could carry him, the idea of turning his cousin's girlish liking for him to some good account never entered his idle brain. I doubt if he even had any correct notion of the amount of his uncle's fortune, and I am certain that he never for one moment calculated upon the chances of any part of that fortune ultimately coming to himself, so that when one fine spring morning, about three months before the time of which I am writing, the postman brought him the wedding cards of Sir Michael and Lady Audley, together with a very indignant letter from his cousin, setting forth how her father had just married a wax dollish young person, no older than Alicia herself, with flaxen ringlets and a perpetual giggle, for I am sorry to say that Miss Audley's animus caused her to do so describe that pretty musical laugh which had been so much admired in the late Miss Lucy Graham, when, I say these documents reached Robert Audley, 
They elicited neither vexation nor astonishment in the lymphatic nature of that gentleman. He read Alicia's angry, crossed, and recrossed letter without so much as removing the amber mouthpiece of his German pipe from his mustached lips. When he had finished the perusal of the epilis, which he read with the dark eyebrows elevated to the center of his forehead, his only manner of expressing surprise, by the way, he deliberately threw that and the wedding cards into the waste paper basket, and putting down his pipe, prepared himself for the exertion of thinking about the subject. I always said the old buffer would marry. Alicia and my lady, the stepmother, will go at it hammer and tongs. I hope they won't quarrel in the hunting season, or say unpleasant things to each other at the dinner table. Rows always upset a man's digestion. At about twelve o'clock on the morning following that night upon which the events recorded in my last chapter had taken place, the baronet's nephew strolled out of the temple, Blackfriars Ward, on his way to the city. He had in an evil hour obliged some Nicitius friend by putting the ancient name of the Audley across a bill of accommodation, which bill not having been met by the drawer, Robert was called upon to pay. For this purpose he sauntered up Ludgate's Hill, with his blue necktie fluttering in the hot August air, and thence to a refreshingly cool banking house in a shady court out of St. Paul's churchyard, where he had arrangements for selling out a couple of hundred pounds worth of consoles. He had transacted this business and was loitering at the corner of the court, waiting for a chance handsome to convey him back to the temple, when he was almost knocked down by a man of about his own age who dashed headlong into the narrow opening. "'Be so good to look as where you're going, my friend,' Robert remonstrated mildly to the impetuous passenger. "'You might give a man a warning before you throw him down and trample upon him.' The stranger stopped suddenly, looked very hard at the speaker, and then gasped for breath. Bob! he cried, in a tone expressive of the most intense astonishment. I only touched British ground after dark last night, and to think I should meet you this morning. I've seen you somewhere before, my bearded friend, said Mr. Audley, calmly scrutinizing the animal face of the other. "'But I'd be hanged if I can remember you when or where. "'What?' exclaimed the stranger reproachfully. "'What? You don't mean to say that you've forgotten George Talby's?' "'No, I have not,' said Robert, with an emphasis by no means usual to him, and then hooking his arm into that of his friend, he led him into the shady court, saying with his old indifference, "'And now, George, tell us all about it.' George Talby's did tell him all about it, he told that very story which he had related ten days before to the pale governess on board the Argus. And then, hot and breathless, he said that he had a bundle of Australian notes in his pocket, and that he wanted to bank them at the Messrs, who had been his bankers many years before. "'If you'll believe me, I've only just left the courting house,' said Robert. "'I'll go back with you, and we'll settle the manor in five minutes.' They did contrive to settle it in about a quarter of an hour, and then Robert Audley was for starting off immediately if for the Crown and Scepter or the Castle Richmond, where they could have a bit of dinner and talk over those good old times when they were together in Eton. But George told his friend that before he went anywhere, before he shaved or broke his fast, or in any way refreshed himself after a night journey from Liverpool by express train, he must call at a certain coffee-house in Bridge Street, Westminster, where he expected to find a letter from his wife. "'Then I'll go there with you,' said Robert. "'The idea of you having a wife, George, what a preposterous joke!' As they dashed through the Ludgate Hill, Fleet Street, and the Strand, in a fast hansom, George Talby's poured into his friend's ear all those wild hopes and dreams which had usurped such a dominion over his sanguine nature. "'I shall take a villa on the banks of the Thames, Bob,' he said, "'for the little wife and myself, and we'll have a yacht, Bob, old boy, and you shall lie on the deck and smoke while my pretty one plays her guitar and sings songs to us. 
She's for all the world, like one of those, what's it, names? Who got poor old Ulysses into trouble, added the younger man, whose classic law was not very great. The waiters at the Westminster Coffee House stared at the hollow-eyed, unshaven stranger, with his clothes of colonial cut and his boisterous, excited manner. But he had been an old frequenter of the place in his military days, and when they heard who he was, they flew to do his bidding. He did not want much, only a bottle of soda water, and to know if there was a letter at the bar directed to George Talby's. The waiter brought the soda water before the, the young men seated themselves in a shady box near the disused fireplace. No, there was no letter for that name. The waiter said it with consummate indifference while he mechanically dusted the little mahogany table. George's face blanched to a deadly whiteness. Talby's, he said. Perhaps you didn't hear the name distinctly. T-A-L-B-O-Y-S. Go and look again. There must be a letter. The waiter shrugged his shoulders as he left the room and returned in three minutes to say that there was no name at all resembling Talby's in the letter rack. There was Brown and Sol Sanderson and Pinchbeck. Only three letters altogether. The young man drank his soda water in silence and then leaning his elbows upon the table covered his face with his hands. There was something in his manner which told Robber oddly that this disappointment, trifling as it might appear, was in reality a very bitter one. He seated himself opposite his friend, but did not attempt to address him. By and by George looked up, and mechanically taking a greasy New York Times newspaper of the day before from a heap of journals on the table, stared vacantly at the first page. I cannot tell how long he sat blankly staring at one paragraph amongst the list of deaths before, before his dazed brain took in its full meaning. But after a considerable pause, he pushed the newspaper over to Robert Audley, and with a face that had changed from the dark bronze to a sickly, chalky, grayish white, and with an awful calmness in his manner, he pointed with his finger to a line which ran thus. On the twenty-fourth instance, at Ventnor Isles of Wight, Helen Talby's aged twenty-two. All right, thank you very much for listening to the second installment of Lady Audley's Secret, published in the London Journal on March 28th, 1863. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, it was written by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, and not first published here, but published in installments for the reader to enjoy throughout the year. If you enjoyed it, give us a like, maybe subscribe. So I just hope that you enjoyed this and uh, look forward to the next one next Friday again as well. I'm going to be recording all of these, chopping them up and editing them and posting them in 30-minute installments so that you guys can listen at your leisure. Let me know what you think and now you can drop any comments you like in the, in the videos below. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.